Thanks very much. It's really great being here. Uh, I, the uh, CCC and I go back almost as far the same uh, years. I, uh, my first book, The Puzzle Palace, came out in 1982, and the first uh, CCC was in uh, 1983. So it's really great to have sort of a reunion here. Um, one of the things that uh, I really noticed lately uh, since uh, Edward Snowden was how many people know about NSA. When I first started writing about NSA, the first book I did was The Puzzle Palace in 1982. Virtually nobody had ever heard of NSA. There was a senator, Senator Bill Bradley, uh, one of the uh, most prominent senators in uh, the US Congress. I was in a car with him going to uh, a speaking engagement and he said, what's your book about? And I said, it's about NSA. And he said, what's that? So we got on a TV show and the host asked me, how secret is NSA? And I said, well, even Senator Bradley had never heard of it. So he got up and went uh, back to the hotel by himself. He didn't want to ride in the same car with me after he uh, <laughs> thought I insulted him. But uh, um, So that's how uh, little known NSA was uh, back then. And uh, uh, last summer I... Uh, spent with uh, Ed Snowden. I ha hung out with him for three days in Moscow for a cover story for Wired magazine. Um, and it was really quite amazing. Uh, we had pizza together and hung out for three days and uh, really amazing uh, being with him. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, has changed now, it's back in the old days, NSA, the old joke was it stood for no such agency or never say anything. And now it stands for not secret anymore. Uh, which uh, Ed got a big kick out of. So I really never talked about my background because, uh, and it was the same way with uh, Ed when I was talking to him because he just never wanted to give me anything about his background. It was like pulling teeth to find out how he got into this whole thing when he was growing up, what he was reading, that kind of thing. Um, so I never really talked about it. And then when I was with Laura Poitras, uh, Last year, I, uh, I told her, you know, I'd been a whistleblower at one time with NSA, although I never made any, um, really never mentioned it before. So she wanted me to write a cover story or write a, uh, a big piece for her publication, uh, The Intercept, and I did. So I began talking a little bit about it. So I thought it might be interesting to give a little background before I get into my main talk. Anyway, uh, in the Navy, uh, I was really lucky during the Vietnam War, I got number one on the draft. You know, it's the only thing I ever won in my life. Um, and I don't really consider that winning. But anyway, I spent three years in the Navy. And like Snowden, I got sent to a uh, NSA, secret NSA place in Hawaii for three years. Um, I did a few other things like fishing, uh, but um, I also did this work for the NSA. Um, but it was mostly focused on Vietnam and so forth. And then uh, after that, I uh, was in law school. Uh, that's a picture of me when I have more hair. Um, so when I was in law school, um, I had to think about what I was going to do. And uh, uh, one of the things while I was there, I was still in the Navy Reserve. And so the Navy, uh, I had to do two weeks active duty once a year. So the Navy sent me down to another listening post. Uh, it was called Sabana Seca in Puerto Rico. And uh, it was a big listening post. They were mostly focused on uh, Cuba and uh, South America, Central America, the Caribbean. Um, and that's big round circle. They're nicknamed elephant cages because those are antennas, those huge things going around, about a quarter of a mile wide. And the people work in that little uh, uh, central square box there. That's where all the interceptions done. Um, and uh, not many people have ever seen the inside of one of those, uh, but I'll show you what it looked like in there with all the people listening. There they are. That's what it was in there. You can see Barack and, uh, and uh, George down there. They got their training down there. Um, anyway, so we were in the... Uh, uh, I was doing the... Um, the work in the listening post. I was mostly trying to avoid work. I was just down there for two weeks active duty. And then uh, um, someday I went out drinking with the night before 
saw me and said, hey, you want to listen to something? So I, uh, I said, look, I don't really speak Spanish much. I don't, you know, it's not going to do me much good. Um, so he says, no, no, it's English. I said, English? Well, okay, I'll put the earphones on. And what do you know, it was Americans talking to each other. I thought it was kind of odd. I was supposed to be listening to the, uh, you know, South Americans or Cubans or somebody like that. So... Um, this is sort of what it was like inside. They were uh, doing all the eavesdropping on, on different telephone calls. And, you know, I was very surprised that the, uh, that the Americans were on the other side of the communication. So I decided I, when I got back to uh, law school, um, it was at the same time the church committee was doing their investigation. And so I decided to be a whistleblower, and I called up the church committee, and I said, did you know that the NSA is doing uh, eavesdropping down in uh, Hawaii, or uh, rather down in Puerto Rico? And they had heard uh, from NSA that they had been doing this eavesdropping, uh, but they stopped it a year and a half earlier. And I said, well, I was just down there like last month, and they're still doing it. Um, and at the time, it was a program that was known as uh, Minaret. And they were focused on really the, the most serious criminals and hardened terrorists in the United States, uh, like Jane Fonda. Um, another one was uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock. You can see he's, he's hiding the weapons behind the baby there. Uh, Muhammad Ali. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. So this was... Project Minaret, they were eavesdropping on US communications and all these hardened targets here. Um, so after I told uh, Frank, the, the church committee, about the NSA, uh, they were, like I said, doing their hearings at the time, um, they said, come down to Washington as soon as you can. So the next morning I flew down to Washington and uh, they had, uh, had me brief uh, Senator Frank Church an executive session, a very, uh, it was uh, off the record, kind of a quiet uh, little uh, briefing in his office. And when I told him that the NSA is still doing what they said they stopped a year and a half earlier, uh, he practically flipped. Uh, he, uh, he was really angry, you know, so he, he uh, decided to send his staff on a surprise visit down to Puerto Rico to check out what was going on. And uh, again, the people at the listening post had no idea that these people were coming down. So what happened was uh, uh, they did the surprise visit down at Savannah Seca. They flew down there. And when they got down there, the, uh, they really caught these guys by surprise. I mean, the, the, the station chief started running away. All the, all the people, they started really hiding out wherever they could. <laughs> so, um, anyway, when, uh, when the staff got back to uh, Washington, they told Senator Frank Church what was going on. You know, all of a sudden, he found out the NSA was lying. I mean, who knew the NSA would actually lie? So... Um, you know, that was a big shock. The NSA uh, 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 had been telling him for a year and a half we stopped it, and all of a sudden they're still doing it. So uh, it was a big shock. It was a shock to me, too. You know, I was surprised NSA would do something like that. So at the time, I was in law school, and uh, when I graduated, instead of, uh, you know, handling divorces or doing something for in, uh, in law, uh, I decided to become a writer. And... Because uh, of what I saw with NSA and all that, I decided to become um, uh, the writer of the first book on NSA, The Puzzle Palace, which was a really interesting uh, thing. I spent three years on it. Nobody had ever done a book on NSA. It was very, uh, it was like exploring a, a, a brand new continent. One of the things that I uh, discovered in doing my research was this document here. Um, it was a document I got under the Freedom of Information Act from the Justice Department. It was an extraordinarily interesting document. Nobody ever knew that this document existed. There were only two copies of it ever, ever made. Uh, and what it was was the criminal file of NSA. Uh, 
1975, the Justice Department actually began a criminal investigation of NSA. The first time a uh, federal agency had ever been subject to an actual criminal investigation. Um, but it was top secret. They, uh, they wouldn't tell anybody that this investigation was going on. And then by the time uh, the investigation was ended, uh, they felt that everything was too secret uh, to actually bring anybody to trial. But they actually uh, uh, read the Miranda rights to the senior officials at NSA. Um, they considered the whole agency a potential criminal entity, uh, you know, like the mafia. Uh, so, uh, and they found, they found 20 different areas where they could prosecute, but they decided, at, you know, including eavesdropping on Jane Fonda and all these people, so. Uh, but because of the secrecy, they said they, uh, they couldn't uh, bring it to court. Uh, but what happened was that uh, uh, the Justice Department er, had released that document to me under uh, the Free Information Act, but NSA had no idea that they released it to me. So uh, when NSA found out, they reclassified it as top secret and demanded I give it back, uh, which I wasn't about to do, uh, but they were really uh, uh, insistent and they were threatening me with the espionage statute. There is a part of the espionage statute that says if you come into possession of classified documents and refuse to return them to the proper custodian, uh, you could be charged under the espionage statute. So, um, uh, but regardless, I decided not to um, uh, give it back. Uh, and they eventually went away, but um, when I did the piece for The Intercept, uh, the uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald and, and the Intercept people put it online so it's now available. If you go to the Intercept and look at my article, you could read the, uh, that top secret report. So um, this, that's what happened. They, they threatened me with prosecution. Uh, that's what was going through my mind at the time when they were threatening me with prosecution there. I could just see myself uh, 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 being arrested and so forth. Uh, but um, uh, what they wanted to do actually was stop the book from coming out. Uh, they had two, threatened me twice with prosecution, once when the, uh, I wouldn't give the documents back, and once before the book came out, because they said the book is going to contain all kinds of secrets, but it came out. Um, and there were a few un unhappy people at NSA. There were a few people that weren't very happy that my book came out. I took some pictures of a few of them there. Uh, they, uh, they just overreacted a little bit to the fact that I uh, was writing this book. Anyway, now let me get back to what I was going to be talking about here. It was the, uh, uh, the NSA and uh, its relationship with the corporate world, with the telecom companies and all that. I mean, this is NSA. It's uh, uh, the largest intelligence agency on Earth. Uh, uh, more than 37,000 cars are registered there. It has its own post office, 70,000 pieces of mail a day, 32 miles of road. You can't see this, uh, that whole complex from the road. It's all hidden. Um, but uh, it's just one gigantic agency. The, the um, uh, headquarters itself, the U.S. Capitol building, can fit in there four times over. So um, it's a monstrous agency, uh, but it didn't start out that way. This is how it started out. That's uh, 141 East 37th Street, New York. That was the original NSA. It was called the Black Chamber in 1920. Um, it was a, uh, a four-story townhouse in Manhattan. The first floor was a cover. It was, they made supposedly commercial codes. The top floor was where this guy lived. He was, the, he was in charge. Uh, his name was Herbert Oliardi. He was the first head of the Black Chamber. Um, it started in 1920. Um, prior to that, there was World War I, and during World War I, the uh, U.S. had censorship so they could get access to everybody's communications during wartime. Um, but um, after the war, uh, censorship was ended, so they had the, uh, it, once again, it was time for privacy and, sense, and, uh, and uh, uh, communications were not allowed to be intercepted by anybody, including the government. Uh, 
But the government came in every once in a while and, and uh, did some eavesdropping. And that was the, the way Herbert Yardley found it when he created the Black Chamber in 1920. He found uh, he had no way to get access to all that information he had during World, World War I. So the whole idea was he had to make relationships with the telecom companies. This is the very first origin of the uh, NSA, NSA's predecessor, having secret agreements with the telecom companies. And uh, what Herbert Yardley did uh, was he went to uh, New York City. He decided to uh, knock on the doors of the telegraph companies. This is uh, back in those days, that was the email of the day, telegrams. That's how people communicated electronically uh, uh, with each other. So he wanted access to everybody's telegrams just the way the NSA gets access to everybody's metadata, telephone calls, email, and all that today. Uh, so Yardley went to the, uh, the heads of the telecom companies and uh, knocked on their door. And at Western Union, for example, uh, he said it was easier than I imagined. Uh, after the minute, pull our, uh, after we put all our cards on the table, President Carlton anxiously uh, seemed anxious to do everything he could for us. So, no problem with Western Union. They, uh, despite it, the fact that it was against the law, they, they uh, uh, cooperated with Yardley. Then he went across town to the, there were three big companies uh, doing this at the time. He went across to the Postal Telegraph headquarters. That was the other big uh, company doing it. They were a little bit more nervous and they actually had a cutout, some lawyer uh, that they had to deal with, uh, with Yardley, because they were very afraid of uh, getting arrested. Um, and then he uh, finally got all the cooperation of all the different companies um, and all the companies began sending all their telegrams to NSA, uh, just like NSA is getting all this uh, email today. Back then, uh, the companies cooperated and they began sending all their uh, telegrams to the to the Black Chamber. I'm not sure about the singing telegrams, whether they made it there or not, but uh, um, by the end of uh, 1920, the Black Chamber had the secret and illegal cooperation of virtually the entire American um, uh, cable industry, the uh, telegram industry. But in 1929, it all came to an end. Uh, Henry Simpson, uh, Simpson was the Secretary of State uh, he had no idea that the government had a black chamber, that the government was actually doing all this eavesdropping. So as a result, he, uh, he shut down the black chamber, uh, 1929. And that put uh, Herbert Yardley out of work. Uh, he'd been doing it for 10 years, and now all of a sudden he was out of a job. Uh, so he decided to become the world's first uh, NSA whistleblower. Um, so uh, long before Yardley, uh, long before uh, Snowden, Herbert Yardley became a whistleblower, he wrote a book called The American Black Chamber. I mean, the government was extremely upset, but they had never heard of this before. Nobody had ever written a book about uh, secret things in government before. Um, so they tried to ban the book, or they tried to put him in jail, but there were no laws at that time that could really do that. So um, uh, he tried another book after that. Uh, it was called Japanese Diplomatic Secrets, 1921 to 1922. And he actually included real uh, messages that he took from the Black Chamber in the book. And the government got furious and they, uh, they secretly uh, basically stole his manuscript. And uh, that manuscript was hidden for years and years until I found that manuscript uh, in, in government documents back in uh, around 82 when my book came out. So after they closed the Black Chamber, uh, the NSA, there was no real NSA for a while because uh, the Black Chamber was closed, but the British had been doing this for a very long time. I mean, the British had been eavesdropping on, on communications around the world for uh, virtually since the beginning of the century, uh, last century, even maybe even before that. This is a map from 1901 of the undersea cables. And that was how the British were able to eavesdrop on so much communications. I mean, this, again, didn't just start a few years ago. The British have been doing this uh, for more than 100 years now uh, because they owned all the cables around the world. That's, those are all the cables owned by the, the Brits. So if they own the cables around the world, they uh, uh, have an easy job of doing all the eavesdropping, and they've been doing it ever since. 
And then World War II came, they had censorship again, and once again, uh, they could eavesdrop uh, because of censorship. And then when World War II ended, um, the NSA was back in the same position where Yardley was. All of a sudden, uh, censorship ended, the, the privacy laws came back into play, and they were without any kind of uh, access to, to the cables and the, tele, uh, the telecom companies. So instead of Yardley, now you had this uh, Brigadier General uh, uh, Preston Quarterman who uh, had to make the rounds up in New York. Um, he had to uh, go up there, and they weren't as friendly as uh, when Yardley found him. Uh, he was uh, getting some resistance from uh, uh, a number of companies, including uh, ITT. They basically threw him out the door. They said, they listened to their general counsel, and they said, this is against the law. You, what are you talking about? We're not going give, to give you uh, our telegrams. Um, so what he did was he walked across the street uh, or a couple of blocks away to Western Union headquarters. And uh, Western Union, um, uh, they weren't happy. Their general counsel uh, uh, didn't want him to do it, but they did agree, providing that the uh, Attorney General of the United States secretly approve it. And, uh, and then they, they would uh, cooperate and give all their telegrams to, uh, to NSA. So then... Um, Quarterman goes back uh, to ITT and basically uh, uh, intimidates them, says, uh, look, uh, you don't want to be the only company not cooperating with us, so we just got uh, Western Union cooperating. So then, because of that, uh, ITT agreed. Again, they uh, wanted uh, uh, cooperation as long as they wanted a, a, a grant of immunity, secret grant of immunity from the Attorney General in case they got caught. Uh, so then they went to RCA, the third biggest company doing all this, uh, and uh, um, going in there and saying the other two companies have cooperated, that, uh, that pretty much uh, sealed it for RCA. They said, okay, you know, we'll do it uh, because the other companies are doing it, but again, we want this, uh, this letter from the, uh, from the Attorney General. Um, because they're very, they were very afraid of being prosecuted. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, how the NSA got the material. They, um, uh, they set up a secret office in New York. They had it masqueraded as a television tape processing company. And uh, every night, uh, just after midnight, somebody would go to the back door of the telecom companies and uh, uh, ask for the, uh, the, all the, the, the communications for that day, all the telegrams coming into the country, going out of the country, or going through the company. And... Uh, they would take, them, take the, uh, the, the tapes back to the, uh, uh, the phony television tape processing company. They make duplicates of all those uh, uh, telegrams, millions of telegrams. And then they uh, send them down to, they, they make a copy. They take the original back to the uh, company before the day shift came in, before the morning shift, because it was only the midnight shift that knew this was going on. And, uh, and then they send the... the uh, the dupes down to uh, NSA, and they put them through this huge computer. It was the uh, biggest, fastest, most powerful computer at the time. It was appropriately called the Harvest Computer because that's what it did. It harvested all the names of everybody they were looking for, <clears throat> uh, names of people they were looking for, words, phrases, whatever they were looking for. The computer would go all through these. Uh, you know, in law school, we were told that uh, if you're in the government, you want to get access to somebody's telegram, uh, you have to go to a judge, and uh, an impartial judge, and present probable cause and so forth. Never occurred to NSA. They just got everybody's telegram and uh, without any kind of a warrant. So, you know, these companies are getting very nervous here. Uh, Sarnoff from RCA, for example, and uh, Western Union, these other companies are getting very, very nervous that, uh, that they're doing this because it is totally illegal and they didn't particularly want to go to jail. Uh, and they were getting worried because uh, they weren't getting this letter that had been promised from the Attorney General. And they, they uh, were thinking that they're maybe getting uh, steamrolled here. And one of these days, uh, you know, the New York Times is going to come up with a story and they're going to head off to uh, court for prosecution. So... Uh, so instead of this letter, uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a five-star general at the time. He was chief of staff of the, uh, of the U.S. Army. 
uh, he sent a letter of appreciation to him. I mean, it didn't really mean much, but that's the best they could do at the time. Um, that's Eisenhower. Um, and again, this is when Truman was president. So uh, it didn't do much good. The, uh, the heads of the telecom companies were still very nervous. Uh, they were very afraid that um, um, uh, they were going to go to jail, so they were putting more pressure on, um, on the Pentagon, basically, to come up with some kind of a uh, guarantee that they weren't going to be prosecuted. What happened was that the uh, uh, Forrestal was, was uh, the Secretary of Defense at the time, and uh, Forrest, Forrestal had a meeting with them, uh, and he told them he was speaking for the president, and as long as the Attorney General was in office, he could guarantee, or he could give assurances anyway, that the Department of Justice would do everything in his power uh, to keep them out of jail. It didn't make him feel too good, but it was better than nothing. Um, but they still wanted something in writing, something from the government that said that, look, what we're doing here is, is uh, uh, on behalf of the president or somebody. Um, the problem was that uh, 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 the only person that knew what they were doing, basically, was Forrestal, the Secretary of Defense. And all of a sudden, he resigned. Um, not only that, a few weeks later, uh, uh, he was in, uh, in hospital, in the hospital for psychiatric uh, examination. Um, and then he put a sash around his neck and uh, jumped out of the 16th floor window of Bethesda Naval Hospital. Um, among the people that were very worried were the uh, people in the telecom companies. But four days earlier, uh, luckily, uh, they had uh, met with the, the person who took Forrestal's place, uh, Lewis Johnson. And, uh, and uh, he gave him the assurances that the Attorney General uh, and the President had both approved this. Um, and they were presented a memorandum. Um, and the mem memorandum was actually, uh, it wasn't signed by Truman, uh, but it was initialed by Truman, or initialed that he had been, uh, been okayed by the President, Tom Clark. Um, and that was it. That's the last time the telecom ch uh, chiefs ever sought assurances. But it did indicate that uh, at least the, uh, the knowledge of this went as high as uh, Truman, the fact that they were doing this illegal um, uh, eavesdropping on everybody's uh, uh, telecom communications. So, uh, Nobody knew anything about this until the church committee. That was in 1975. The church committee had this uh, investigation. They found out that NSA had been doing this. And uh, I had testified in uh, executive session before the church committee, as I mentioned earlier, my little part. Um, and they you know, did a really good job of looking into what NSA was doing in terms of spying. But they were still somewhat... Uh, 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 falling in line with regard to NSA. NSA was saying, please, please don't uh, uh, say much about all this stuff. So they only had one day of hearings uh, on NSA, and it was the director of NSA that was called to, uh, to testify. But they never really got into the telecoms, what the telecoms were doing. The only person that did that was this woman, uh, Bella Abzuk. I mean, she was, uh, she was like the ultimate terror in Congress. You never, ever wanted to cross Bella Abzuk. I mean, she was just the most ferocious person in Congress. So she got very angry that the church committee wasn't looking into the companies, uh, the companies that were doing all this, uh, all this eavesdropping illegally. So she decided to hold a hearing. Um, and uh, she was going to call the, all the telecom chiefs to a public hearing and say, what have you been doing? Who'd you cooperate with? What have you given to the government? Uh, and at the time, Jerry Ford was president, and there were two people that really were stopping her from holding a hearing. They were trying to uh, impede her in every way possible. You'll never guess who they were. Uh, one was a guy named Donald Rumsfeld, who was Secretary of Defense at the time. Another guy you may have heard of before, his name was Dick Cheney. Uh, so they, uh, they did everything they could to try to stop uh, Bella Abzuk from holding this hearing of the telecom chiefs. 
Um, and they went so far as to uh, issue executive privilege against the companies. I mean, this had never been done before. Nobody ever heard of, how can you issue executive privilege against the company? You know, you issue it against uh, the, uh, the CIA or the NSA or the FBI or whoever, but not private companies. Uh, so for the first time in history, uh, Ford, uh, at the uh, suggestions of Rumsfeld and Cheney, um, issued executive privilege to keep the companies from testifying in public uh, in Bell Abzug's uh, hearing. But uh, uh, the companies were more afraid of Bell Abzug than they were of Cheney, <laughs> Rumsfeld, and Ford. <laughs> So they all, they all took the stand, they all testified, and they told basically what, uh, what the NSA had been making them do. They even gave a list of the targets and everything else. So it was really amazing. I, I, I uh, really have to hand it to Bella Abzug. She really uh, got a lot more out of these people than anybody else, I think, would have at the time. So one of the reforms that came out of the Church Committee and Bell Abzug and all that was creation of the FISA Court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which everybody's heard of now. Uh, a few years ago, hardly anybody ever heard of the FISA Court. Um, and uh, these are the judges here. They're, uh, they're sort of, they, this is the robes they wear. They wear them over the tops of their heads so nobody can see who they are. Um, but the FISA Court was created and uh, basically became a rubber stamp. They, uh, this is where they're, they hang out, the third floor. Of, it's supposed to be secret where they're hanging out, but they, their office is on the third floor of the uh, federal court building in Washington. Uh, few people have actually been inside that. Uh, I did manage to get one picture inside the court, or the court in session. It's n never been seen before. I'll show it to you here. These are the, these are the judges right here. They, uh, you can see they, uh, they really don't want to know what they're doing um, or what they're signing, but they rubber stamp like 30,000 warrants. I think they only rejected two in 30 years. But that was sort of the, uh, the reform. And, and for 30 years, uh, from 1978 until uh, uh, 2001, there weren't really that many problems. They just rubber stamped everything and, and everything sort of went normally. Until, uh, until this happened, um, until Khalid al Midar. And this is a place very few people have been. I'm one of, I think, one of the very few people uh, uh, have been there and lived to tell about it. This is actually uh, Osama bin Laden's operational center in Yemen, outside of, uh, outside of Sana'a. I, I did a documentary for PBS, and we went there and filmed it. Uh, this is where actually all the operations took place, or where, where the people were kind of trained, where they were based, and it was Bin Laden's communication center. He didn't, uh, it, Bin Laden would communicate to the house from Afghanistan, where most of the operations were being planned. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the people in the house, Khalid al Midar, uh, was married to the uh, daughter of the owner of the house, and he lived there. And Khalid al Midar and Nawaf al Hazmi were the first two terrorists. Uh, what's interesting is that NSA had been eavesdropping on that house for years. They were eavesdropping on everything that went in and everything that came out. Bin Laden used a satellite phone that was never encrypted. Um, and so they were just eavesdropping on the house. So the whole 9 11 uh, uh, activity took place. Um, there, or the first indication of 9-11 took place uh, in December of 1999. That was when a phone call was made from bin Laden to that house saying, send Khalid and Nawaf uh, to Kuala Lumpur for the big meeting. And that was the uh, first tip-off of 9-11. Of, uh, of NSA had picked it up. So... NSA had kind of known about these guys since the very beginning, since uh, 1999, uh, December 99, when this meeting was set up. Um, 
And uh, these were the terrorists, they came to the United States and so forth. Khalid Al-Midar and Wafa Hazmi were the first two. Um, and so the NSA finally, after, after a couple of years, finally realized the, in the last month or so that uh, these guys were in the United States and they had this mad scramble to try to find them. I mean, they, they, uh, they basically ignored the intelligence up until that time. They were eavesdropping on them even while they were in the United States. Uh, Khalid Al-Midar, he was in San Diego and he was actually calling back to that house. So NSA was picking up that communications. Um, so these guys had to find some place. So the crew that was going to blow up the Pentagon had to find some place to make their headquarters uh, for like six weeks before the attack. Um, and at the same time, NSA is looking for him everywhere at this time. They're like three weeks or so before the attack, they suddenly realize, you know, oh God, we got to find where some of these guys are. I think they're terrorists. Um, and so, uh, so the terrorists, uh, set up their, their, uh, headquarters at this place here. Uh, it was called the Valencia Motel. And uh, it happened to be in a place called Laurel, Maryland, which happened to be uh, just uh, two miles from NSA headquarters. Uh, I've actually been in the director's office at NSA. Uh, I've been, I interviewed uh, 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 General Hayden there one time for one of my books. And you could almost see the Valencia Motel from his office. So, uh, These guys were um, uh, going to the same gyms that the NSA people were going to in Laurel. They were shopping in the same supermarkets, and NSA is looking all over for them. You know, they're eavesdropping on everybody, but they can't find them, and, and they're right down the street, literally down the street. So um, after 9-11, after uh, George Bush decided... Uh, you know, he can't trust the FISA court anymore, so uh, he decided to bypass the FISA court and do all the, uh, the begin the whole program of warrantless eavesdropping, um, which became Stellar Wind. And uh, uh, one of the things that came out in the, one of the first documents that Snowden, actually the first document that was released from the Snowden archive, um, was the Inspector General's report on... Uh, on stellar wind, and what it showed was that um, not only did they, like back in Yarley's day and back after World War II where they had to go and get the telecom companies to cooperate, uh, AT&T actually volunteered before they were even asked. They called up NSA and they said, uh, can we do something, you know, would, would you like our, our material here? And, uh, and NSA was sort of, um, um, uh, shocked because this is even before they started the warrantless eavesdropping. Um, and so at NSA, they were saying, well, how should we do this? I mean, we've never had somebody offer, some company offers all this material before. So then they finally figured out some, some phony legal uh, authorization from uh, John Yu at the Justice Department and so forth. And, and that was the beginning of the warrantless eavesdropping in the secret room and in, uh, in uh, San Francisco's uh, uh, telecom center. And then from there, uh, they went to the cable companies. And it's a li little uh, less clear what the cooperation was because they had uh, PRISM, the uh, PRISM uh, uh, program where they went in the front door basically with uh, uh, sort of legal papers, uh, uh, FISA warrants, things like that, and then they had the uh, uh, Operation Muscular where they secretly tapped the unencrypted cables between the, uh, the uh, data centers and so forth. So, um, again, we never would have learned about any of that uh, uh, without the uh, help of these people here. Bill Benny, uh, uh, I was the first one really to interview Bill Benny. I put him in a cover story I did for Wired Magazine on the... Uh, on the big data center in Utah. Uh, and, you know, Bill Benny is a real uh, uh, hero to me. I, I interviewed him, and he was a senior official at NSA, and I said, look, uh, you know, I could say senior government official or source or whatever, you know, I don't have to use your name. 
um, because you're going to be in a lot of trouble, possibly. And he says, no, I wanted my name in there. So uh, I uh, left his name in there, and, and he's been, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the shining lights, even before Snowden, uh, 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 telling what went on at NSA in terms of the warrantless eavesdropping. So I've got a lot of admiration for him. Um, and then uh, Tom Drake, uh, I was uh, on his legal team. The legal team hired me to be the uh, uh, legal consultant. And uh, he was facing 35 years in prison um, for cooperating with Siobhan Gordon, uh, the Baltimore Sun at the time. Uh, the NSA wanted to use him as, a, uh, uh, as an example to all the other NSA people, saying, if you ever even think about leaking, this is what's going to happen to you. So uh, 35 years in prison, rest of his life, basically. Um, but when I looked at the, uh, uh, the case, I said, look, a lot of this stuff is probably in the public domain. So I spent three months uh, searching through everything in the public domain. And uh, I came up with two big binders of virtually all the material that they were charging him with as being top secret. So uh, after we did that, and I was able to show not only was this information in the public domain, but it had been placed there by the government itself, by a speech by Mike Hayden or whatever. Um, and once we presented that to the judge and the prosecutors, and having you know, actually worked on a number of espionage cases over the years, I'd never seen anything like this. Uh, they actually came back, and they dropped the case. They dropped the whole case against... Uh, uh, Tom Drake, uh, it's never happened in an espionage case. And, and they said, uh, we'll drop the case. All you have to do is just sign this little piece of paper uh, saying you agreed to, uh, um, uh, saying that you um, plead guilty to a misdemeanor. It was actually less than a parking ticket because there was no fine and no jail time. Uh, so um, uh, I was really happy to see that. And Kirk Wiebe... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Tom went through hell. <laughs> and Tom's been speaking out ever since. So, I, again, these are all my heroes here. And Kirk, Kirk Wiebe was working with Bill Benny, and uh, he helped me also. And then uh, Chelsea Manny, of course. He, uh, you know, he, he, people don't realize uh, the trauma you go through when you're actually in combat and you watch uh, uh, people gunned down, innocent civilians uh, gunned down, and that's what... Uh, got Chelsea Manning to um, um, decide to become a whistleblower, and there were uh, an, uh, just enormous amounts of information that came out from some of his documents. And then, of course, Ed Snowden, and uh, uh, there's never been anybody like Ed Snowden. I hope there's a lot of people that follow in his uh, footsteps, but uh, the information that he had uh, was just astounding. I've written about NSA for 30 years. I just couldn't believe half the stuff that was coming out from, from his documents. So, you know, I'm really a big supporter of whistleblowers. Uh, the, the, there's really two uh, forces out there. Uh, one is the force of fear, the fear mongers who are always pushing for um, uh, more surveillance and uh, scaring everybody with, uh, uh, with fear. You know, there's been, I think there were four terrorists, uh, four people killed in the United States last year by terrorists. There are 24 people killed by dog bites. Um, and that's an average, uh, except for 9-11, every other year is normally like that. So it's just fear-mongering. The only, only thing opposing that, uh, the only thing opposing fear is information, and the only people that can get the information out are the whistleblowers. So uh, what's the takeaway? The takeaway, the, what, uh, <sighs> What I took away from all this is that, uh, number one, the NSA and the telecoms have been secretly cooperating for uh, nearly a century. I mean, what just didn't happen with uh, George Bush has been going on for a long time. Number two, uh, they occasionally get caught, but no one ever gets punished or prosecuted. Uh, either the ease, neither the eavesdroppers nor the companies. I mean, they just, they do it, they get caught, and they just keep doing it again. Uh, and number three, as I just said, after they uh, get caught, they stop for a while, and then they just resume their illegal eavesdropping, one after another. So, um, what's the answer? Uh, one answer, uh, have a major church-style investigation, but this time, uh, not by Congress. I mean, what's Congress going to do? Investigate themselves? Um, 
this time have sort of a 9-11 commission, but not, you know, a lot of old government hacks on there, put some uh, journalists, writers, privacy advocates, you know, some people um, um, uh, like former Senator Udall, for example, or soon to be former uh, Senator. Um, uh, number two, have a major Bella Abzug style hearing and force the companies to, uh, to testify about their involvement publicly. And three, have the Justice Department begin another full-blown uh, full criminal investigation of the NSA. Now, all these things have a precedent. I mean, the, a major investigation as a church committee as a precedent, calling the, uh, the telecoms as Bella Abzug's hearing as a precedent, and the 1975 criminal investigation of NSA uh, uh, is a precedent for a new investigation. Uh, just one thing different they should do this time, however, Let's prosecute them. <laughs> you know, having worked in law on and off, especially espionage cases since I got out of law school, uh, um, I've seen a lot of the criminal justice system, and to some degree it does work, you know, it does work. You put somebody in jail, a lot of times they, they stop doing what, they're, what they have been doing. Um, so. This will come very easy for NSA. Uh, I've even worked out a plan. You see, that's NSA headquarters. Right across the street, there's an abandoned uh, uh, <laughs> asylum for the criminal insane. You just march them across. Very easy. And like I said, it, it, it does work. It, it, after they're in there for a while, it will work. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you that, uh, you know, uh, you have General Alexander in a prison cell for a while. When he comes out, he's going to be reformed. And this is what he's going to look like. So uh, after he gets out of prison, after he reforms, after he uh, becomes an advocate for Ed Snowden, uh, then uh, the next thing that's going to happen is Ed Snowden's going to go on the Cryptologic Hall of Fame right next to uh, Herbert Yardley, who was also uh, 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 charged with being a whistleblower. After 70 years, believe it or not, after 70 years in 1999, despite the fact that they were uh, basically uh, ready to prosecute uh, Herbert Yardley for writing a book, um, um, they put him on the Cryptologic Hall of Fame. So in 70 years, I, I predict that uh, Ed Snowden is going to be up there along with uh, Herbert O. Yardley. So uh, anyway, listen, I appreciate all your uh, attention here, and I'm happy to take any kind of questions anybody would like to ask. Yeah, big thank you to this talk. It was quite great, and a lot of people wanted to see it that were not allowed to come in here, so there were even more people uh, liking your talk. Anyway, you have time for some questions and answers, and maybe you should start to ask them. I know that there's one question on the internet at the moment. Yes. Uh, one question here is, in New Zealand researcher Nikki Hager has written about his country's involvement in the NSA-1 surveillance network. One example he recounted was that analysis in New Zealand were told by the US to prioritize economic signal intelligence of Japan over all else. Given that we have examples of US corporate entities profiting from second over competitors, is it fair to say that the sole purpose of Echelon is to uphold US economic economy, that second relating to crime, etc., et is its secondary purpose? Um, yeah, the question has to do with uh, whether NSA is doing economic intelligence. I've actually testified before the European Parliament on this. Um, it's a more nuanced, uh, complicated question. Uh, the NSA doesn't, uh, I don't think the NSA spies on um, Airbus, for example, and then passes that information on 
onto Boeing. It's just too complicated to do that. They'd have to set up a skiff at Boeing, and then they'd have to give it to Lockheed and everything else. So I don't think there's, there's, I don't think there's uh, economic espionage in that sort of micro sense. I think there's economic espionage in the macro sense, where they find out, you know, what the what uh, uh, Petrobras is doing down in. Uh, down in Brazil as part of uh, uh, more a, a, a larger uh, economic espionage. And, and then they're also eavesdropping on companies that they think may be in violation of uh, embargoes and things. So um, they do do uh, macro uh, espionage. The other area that they uh, do in terms of economics, which is very interesting, and they've been doing this ever since the NSA was created, Anytime there's a, uh, like a G7 or one of these big economic conferences, NSA spends months trying to uh, set up eavesdropping capabilities so they know what everybody at the G7 or whatever, what their negotiating positions are going to be. So on the big macro issue of economics, uh, they do do a lot of spying on individual companies and passing that on to American companies. Uh, I don't think so. but. Uh, one area where that linkage does happen is where people leave NSA and then go to work for the companies, and then they know what uh, they've known for years what uh, the, the companies don't know because they've been eavesdropping on them. Okay, the next question is coming from the room. It's from number two here. So do you believe that the U.S. government is capable of investigating itself that things like uh, Abscam from the 1980s in which uh, I think 31 politicians were targeted and only a handful were actually ever followed through to prosecution, do, do you feel that a, uh, a church committee hearing could actually be convened in this day and age? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because, uh, like I mentioned, I, I, I don't think the, the Congress is capable of doing it. Um, I, I thought the 9-11 Commission left a lot to be desired. I, I thought that they did a sloppy job. They virtually did no investigation of NSA at all. Uh, um, on the other hand, you had the uh, presidential panel that was appointed by um, uh, uh, Barack Obama, and they came out, uh, one of them, there was three people on there, four people, something like that. One of them was a former CIA deputy director. Um, and they actually did come out with a recommendation of 46 areas that should be changed, 46 areas that, the, uh, that they thought the government was doing uh, illegal or improper or unethical or immoral or whatever kind of activities. Um, the problem wasn't that they came out with a bad report, they came out with a very good report. The problem was Barack Obama ignored it. I mean, he, he basically brushed it off. He said, okay, there's like three or four, maybe six things that we could change. And then the, the other 40 he ignored. So um, those are the two problems. One is finding government people who will do this, uh, or rather find people that will go on a, com uh, on a committee or whatever that will do an energetic job like the church committee. And the other one is once they've done, uh, will you the Congress, which is now more Republican than ever, or a president uh, go along with it. So it's, a, it's a, really an uphill battle, but you've got to start someplace. And I think uh, starting with a, a full investigation, 9-11 style, of what the government's been doing in terms of eavesdropping, torture, and all that really uh, needs, I mean, we haven't had it since 1975. You know, you need one once a century at least. So uh, anyway, I, I hope so. Okay, the next question is from the four. Yes, you may applause. <laughs> Hi. Um, a few of us watched the 1992 Hollywood film Sneakers the other night, and uh, part of the plot hinges on NSA domestic surveillance. And as far as I know, it wasn't really in the popular consciousness at that time, and it seemed really prescient. And I'm just kind of curious whether um, the producers had some inside track on on uh, some of the revelations that eventually came out in your books. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, whether, who had the re revelations? The producers of oh, the oh. film? Uh, yeah, it, it, you mean whether the producers of the film, uh, Sneakers, had, had uh, uh, insight into NSA through, through what? Through I, I, I'm not sure, it, it, it just seemed very prescient, you know, yeah. based on recent revelations and, uh, um, 
No, that's true. Yeah, no, it, it was a really interesting movie. And there, uh, another one was Enemy of the State that came out in the late '90s. Um, yeah, no, there have been uh, periodic people that have been interested in domestic spying. My first book came out in '82. It was a bestseller and made quite a bit of noise. And I've been writing about it for a long time. The uh, domestic a aspects of it, um, but uh, it didn't really. Uh, the, the public hadn't really caught on to what the NSA was doing uh, since the church committee uh, until the Snowden uh, revelations because, um, I mean, this is very interesting. One of the things that uh, Snowden told me when I was in Moscow uh, was that, you know, he had several choices when he became a whistleblower. Uh, he could become a whistleblower like Bill Benny, who uh, was a whistleblower to me uh, for my Wired article. And what happened in that... Wired article when I interviewed Bill Benny and I put down what Bill Benny said about these all this eavesdropping. Um, General Alexander came out. I don't know if, how many of you saw Laura Poitras's film uh, last night, but uh, there was a scene in there where General Alexander is sitting in front of a congressional con uh, uh, committee, and they're saying, "Does the U.S. do uh, domestic eavesdropping? Does the NSA spy on Americans? Does it eavesdrop on their community?" E uh, emails, and he kept saying, no, no, no. Well, that was a response to my article. My article came out, and so then he testified, and he lied in front of the committees. And so all the, uh, the press, Washington Post and so forth, uh, they reported, oh, this is all nonsense, you know. General Alexander came out, and he said, they don't do it. So of course they don't do it. Um, so Snowden's seeing that, he's, he's seeing that when he's uh, 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 thinking about becoming a whistleblower, and he sees what happens to Bill Benny. Bill Benny comes out, he says, the U.S. is doing all this spying. Alexander comes out, and he says, no, we're not. The press buys into Alexander, because he's got four stars on his, uh, on his shoulders. And uh, so Snowden thinks there's only one way to do this, and that's to actually walk out with the documents. I mean, if I got the documents and I give them to, you know, people in the press, then uh, you're not going to have Alexander being able to lie anymore about it. So um, I think that's one of the things that happened was in the past, people would come out, they'd blow the whistle, uh, NSA would say it's, you know, like Tom Drake or whatever, it's nonsense, and, and, uh, and so then people would, uh, uh, hadn't paid much attention. So that's why I think it was the documents that made the whole difference with Snowden. Okay, then another question from the internet. Yeah. The question is, how is the civic coverage outside of Congress and government about that eavesdropping things? How did the press behave for that time since the founding of the NSA? Was there a civic outcry earlier? Uh, could you just ask me that just one more time? Yeah. How is the civic coverage outside of Congress and government about that eavesdropping things? How did the press behave for that time since the founding of the NSA? Was there a civic outcry earlier? Yeah, good question. You know, the press, how, uh, the, the one big problem is the press. They, uh, uh, they never pay any attention to NSA until there's some big thing like, like Snowden. Uh, when I wrote my first book about NSA, um, the Puzzle Palace in 1982, there had never been anybody in the press that ever did an investigative story on NSA before that. It was just uh, nobody paid attention. It was too hard. Uh, CIA is very easy because they've got sources, you know, drop a dime and you'll get 20 CIA sources show up. It's, they're fairly easy for journalists to find. I mean, you can't leave CIA without writing a book. Uh, I, I, virtually, virtually everybody that leaves CIA writes a book. So there's a million CIA sources. Nobody from NSA has ever written a book. Uh, so NSA sources are very hard. And if it's very hard, the journalists are going to go the easy way, which is CIA, and not pay any attention to NSA. The other thing is, CIA is very easy. You know, it's a spy. They leave a bag behind a tree, and somebody picks it up, uh, or they shoot somebody with a drone. Um, NSA, you got to know a little bit about electronics. You have to know satellites are up in the air, uh, and that uh, radio signals go through. Uh, so, but that's journalists don't usually study science, so it's, NSA is a lot harder for them to deal with. So that's 
a lot of reasons why you hardly ever see people doing investigative stories on NSA, at least pre-Snowden, was because of the, the, first of all, the difficulty of getting sources, and second of all, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, you have to know at least a little bit about science in order to write about NSA. Okay, then the last question from the room. I know that there are more questions, but um, the time is up. So it's number one. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much. My question is, um, if the NSA and other services are not capable of catching so-called terrorists, even if they shop in the same supermarket, why the heck are these agencies there? Is this just for um, making money for a security industry? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you NSA's track record. It missed the first World Trade Center bombing. Uh, it missed the attack on the USS Cole, even though it took place in Yemen, a key target of NSA. It missed the attacks on the... Uh, 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 U.S. embassies in East Africa, um, even though uh, the NSA had been focusing on that house where the, where the uh, operation was planned for years. Um, it missed 9-11. Uh, the director of NSA was having a meeting in his office at the time of 9-11, the director of NSA, and he looks over his TV set and sees the planes going in, you know. So NSA found out about it from a $300 television set. And then after 9-11, they, uh, they missed the uh, Times Square bomber. You know, it was uh, uh, some people in Times Square that happened to find that. They missed the uh, uh, Christmas Day underwear bomber. Completely missed it. They missed the, uh, the, uh, the marathon bombing. So, yeah, uh, the NSA doesn't do that. I mean, it wasn't set up to catch terrorists. It wasn't what it was set up for. It was set up to find when Russia was about to launch a nuclear war, basically. So it's an agency that's not doing what it uh, was set up to do, and it can't do what it's trying to do very well. So, yeah, the, the key beneficiary of all this are the, are the telecom companies, and are the, uh, rather the defense contractors, the, uh, uh, the war profiteers, basically, who make profits on all this stuff. Uh, the, the amount of contractors that make money from NSA is just uh, astonishing. But anyway, that's, uh, that's a simple answer to your question is yes, that's the key beneficiaries of all this. It's not the American public, it's the uh, war profiteers. But thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.